There's a reason why pizza stands in New York City are probably extra busy at 2 or 3 a.m., right? Well, what's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things, okay? The first one is the alcohol side of the equation. Now, in this video, I'm going to break down what alcohol does to your appetite, and then I'm gonna break down what a specific type of food does to your appetite, and it's something that we generally eat after we have a bunch of alcohol. Now, I'm not just gonna end it at that. I will give you some practical solutions to get around this as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. So first off, with alcohol, what ends up happening, and actually I'll just go ahead and reference a study. They gave subjects breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and with lunch, they gave subjects either a lager that had no alcohol, a lager with one unit of alcohol, or four units of alcohol. In a dose-dependent fashion, the more alcohol that was consumed with lunch, the more calories that were consumed, both with lunch and the more the appetite increased after lunch. So most of us that have been in situations where we've been drinking know this to be true, but a lot of times we kind of feel it's like just impaired judgment, right? But it's a little bit more than just that. So let's go ahead and dive into the mechanisms of it. After today's video, check out Thrive Market. They are a sponsor on this channel, so they make this content possible. But also, because you're watching this video, you will get a 30% off discount link for your entire grocery order. A huge thank you to them because they have awesome products, but they also make this content possible and give you awesome discounts. So you can shop by diet category, and then you get it delivered right to your doorstep, and it's at your door in a couple of days. Super easy peasy, lemon squeezy. That link is down below 30% off your entire grocery order, even if it's 500 bucks, plus you get a $50 free gift when you use that link down below. Now, a lot of the mechanisms here are somewhat speculative, but clearly something is going on. The first speculation is that when we consume alcohol, we are not detecting the seven calories per gram from alcohol as normal energy. The body is dealing with that energy at like sort of a surface level, but it's not just actually registering metabolically as fuel. Because even though it's a calorie, it is still being dealt with so quickly because it's a toxin that it's not getting registered as energy. So then the body feels like it's in a deficit. And then it's gonna make you crave more because the signals are all saying, hey man, you need to eat. Now the other side of the equation is, Similar, because alcohol is such a toxin, and I know some people don't want to admit that, but it's true, okay? Alcohol, ethanol, converts into acetaldehyde, which is highly toxic, and the liver has to metabolize it, and it has to take a priority. So the liver prioritizes that above all else. And that means that when it is getting rid of the acetaldehyde and it's dealing with that, you are possibly losing nutrients along with it, mainly serum triglycerides. So when your triglyceride levels drop, then all of a sudden what's going on is the body isn't registering that there's fuel available. It's all a matter of nutrient sensing. If you have glucose and lipids in your bloodstream, the body says, oh, okay, we have fuel on hand. So sometimes it doesn't trigger the same hunger response, but when those start to drop and change, especially rapidly, it triggers the brain to want to go find more food. Okay, well now insert different stimuli, okay? Most of the time, and this is probably due to possibly a lack of judgment, you're not gonna go choose a salad or you're not gonna go choose some broccoli and a chicken breast when you're drunk. What you might go do is grab a slice of pizza. Well, this is very interesting. I don't want you to take this the wrong way, okay? But cheese really does stimulate hunger. Now, I know that a lot of people that watch my channel are lower carb proponents and cheese is on the menu, okay? But we have to be careful, okay? There's 10 times the amount of casein in cheese than there is in milk. Casein by itself, it's not the end of the world, right? It's a perfectly natural thing. But casein does convert into what are called casomorphins, and casomorphins bind to our dopamine receptors. So they trigger a huge pleasure sensation and a huge reward, 10 times that of milk. And from a natural perspective, this makes perfect sense, right? As a baby, when you are going to drink milk, you want to receive a signal that, yes, this is good, do more of it, you need to grow. So yeah, there's casein in milk, but concentrating it into cheese increases the casein levels. So you end up finding yourself wanting more and more and more. Not to mention the fat that's in cheese is actually going to trigger an endorphin response. Does that mean that it's bad? It does certainly not mean that it's bad, but it means that you do feel a very much so addictive nature when it comes down to cheese. You combine that with the nutrient sensing and the impairment of alcohol, and you see where calories probably stack up more than anything. People tend to want to eat cheesy, greasy foods when they are drunk. 
And I don't know why that's the case, but you talk to people and that's what they choose. Okay, I promised that I'd give you some solutions here. First off, with alcohol, try to opt for ones that are triple distilled, quadruple distilled, and don't have congeners, okay? So try to stay away from even the beers and the wines. And if you're going to drink, probably just have some vodka, some gin, or some tequila. Go for like, I know that's not the easiest thing to say, but if you're out there to just drink, oh, that's gonna be the least toxic in the way that your body can probably deal with it quicker, okay? Now people are gonna say, what about the resveratrol in wine? Now I'm gonna pull this out of the side of my mouth. It may or may not be true, but it's probably somewhat accurate. There's more resveratrol in a handful of blueberries than there probably is in a bottle of wine. So I wouldn't really worry about that, okay? And you wanna stay away from the alcohol that has the congeners. So stay away from the brandy, stay away from the bourbon, stay away from the whiskey, things like that, and you can. Now what about the food choices you should make? Now this is easier said than done because if you've been drinking, you might not make the best decisions. But you do wanna opt for things that are going to be a little bit more satiating. One of the tricks that I give people is actually bring some electrolytes with you. Okay, not only does alcohol dehydrate you, but if it dehydrates you, you're going to lose sodium levels and sodium is actually going to make you satisfied. When you are deficient in sodium, the NST neurons in your hindbrain actually communicate with the forebrain to make you wanna eat sweet things they actually make you want to eat salty things too, but they just make you want to eat. So if you can nullify that a little bit by having some electrolytes, you actually might find that you make better decisions because you're not operating out of total craving at the neurological level. So make sure you kind of abide by those things. And if you are aware enough to make good choices, the cheeses that you might want to choose are going to be things like Pecorino Romano. They're going to be things like goat cheese, like sheep feta, because there's a lower casein content. So it's going to be a lesser concentration of the casein converting into casomorphins. But don't be afraid of cheese. Just be aware of this. I'll see you tomorrow.